Oh, Lord, please help us to understand that we are under a demonic curse. Especially when you see things like this, and these are your founding fathers. Or uh, people that you are supposed to administer, admonish and Uh -uh. people that you are supposed to admire and you have been brought up under this type of regimen because in Paris, Thomas Jefferson revealed his real beliefs about slavery. Thomas Jefferson addressed the topic of slavery in notes on the state of Virginia and the published version had extended his views to a wide audience in America, England, and France, where he had discussions with Enlightenment luminaries and French admirers of the United States, particularly Lafayette, Nicolas de Condorcet, and Jacques Brissot, all three of whom felt that Jefferson stopped at a bridge far too short of where anti-slavery ought to go. They would not have known that at his residence, Hotel D. Lank Jefferson had two mulatto servants who in America were legally his slaves. In France, they were not. And by their own simple declaration, they would have been considered free an opportunity which neither Sally nor James Hemmings availed themselves of. They might not have known of this right, or they may have preferred a life of certainties with Jefferson as to one unknown in France. Okay? Y'all listen to this hypocrisy. If it was their choice, it may have been an agreement with their master, including promises of special treatment and advantages. Aware that he was in violation of French law, Jefferson had quietly evaded the legality. As always, when it came to his slaves, he did what was practical and in his own interest. As an intellectual, especially among friends and colleagues, he was rarely reluctant to make it known that he believed that slavery was, in theory, in theory, a moral inequity, a stain on a civilized society. Still, his innate self-protection duplicity often came into play. Now, look, look at this mindset. There's a person down there enslaving people and allowing this behavior to go down, but yet and still he's mating with these people, yet and still he's producing children and he's got uh, he's committing uh, uh, molestation, child abuse, and all this stuff. And it would have been against the law in France. So what he did was he covered it up. So it wasn't that it was a sign that at times it was the psychology. It was the mindset of this demonic individual and a demonic system that would perpetrate that on people and then be so hypocritical to act as if it's not going on or that you're against it. But you are actually perpetrators of it. In same. In France in 1789, the year of the start of the French Revolution, Jefferson's good friend Lafayette, of course, knew that Jefferson owned many slaves. Who else among the members of Jefferson's salon and intellectual political circle knew? When Jacques Bissot, a leading abolitionist and the founder in 1788 of the Society of Friends of Blacks, invited Jefferson to become a member, he declined. It would be incomp incomparable, he said, with his official position. Like that. As um, 
it would be in total opposition in what he was living is what he should have said. Anyway, <laughs> in Lafayette, if Lafayette was ever disappointed in Jefferson, it was with Jefferson's refusal to act on his professed anti-slavery view, as well as his belief that blacks were innately less intelligent than whites. Sometimes Jefferson leaned a little one way on this point, sometimes the other. The idea that emancipated blacks could become capable, competent, and free, self-supporting free laborers seemed to him problematic but possible. Ain't this crazy? That these arrogant papas, ugh, genetic mutant, Neanderthal-thinking people would actually think that they're better than somebody. And they got to have slaves do their bidding for them. How crazy can you be? This is the kind of leadership and rulership we've been under. This this hypoc uh, hypocritical uh, insanity, basically, from a group of people that are called elite. In fall of eight, 1788, he had received a request from Edward Bancroft an American doctor, scientist, and patriotic philand a, a pamphleter living in London for information about the experiment by an anti-slavery planter in Virginia who had liberated his slaves and employed them as paid labor. Bancroft had told this London abolitionist circle that Jefferson had mentioned this incident when they were dinner guests of a mutual friend in 1785. How <laughs> Jefferson could not recall the occasion, but the subject was of interest to him. Bancroft had served as Franklin's assistant during the peace treaty negotiations in Paris in 1783. A double agent, he had been spying for the American colonies and in London and Paris while serving the British though apparently of little consequential help to either side. Jefferson, Jefferson responded early in, 18, in 1789 that as far as I can judge from the experiments which have been made to give liberty to or rather to abandon persons with, whose habits have been formed in slavery is like abandoning children. To get them to work, they needed to be watched and even whipped. You know, and, and now y'all see why they can't allow real history to be taught in school. Because well, it's going to show just how barbaric and insane that the white man has been. So instead of dealing with his miserable insanity... He would prefer to cut the whole history lesson out because it doesn't show him favorably. It shows him as a tyrant, bully, molester, rapist, you know, that he has been towards the black family and brown family and most indigenous people throughout the universe. Mm -hmm. Craziness said, in order to get them to work, they had to be, they needed to be watched and even whipped. It was not the fault of the slaves, he said, for a man's moral sense must be unusually strong. His slavery does not make him a thief. Man, these people who think that they are so much better than the rest of the human family, are really the psychotic ones of the human family. They are so insane that it that is it's totally unrational and totally unreasonable. And the Native Americans say white man speak with forked tongue. That was the best way he could describe it. Uh, I, I, it's, it's insane. It's just insane 
that they would actually, and I think that we can't never fix what we can't face. And if we don't face these psychotic uh, white people that have laid out the foundation of America and that to this point has created nothing but chaos amongst the people, then as a nation, you might as well understand now that our time is up. It's up. And ain't nothing we can do to save it because all the great empires have fallen. It won't be the first one. And this one is going to fall due to this type of craziness. Um, inhumane treatment to other human beings and trying to pass it off as justifiable. Um, it, you can't sustain a society like that. You want to take all the black and brown bodies and put them in jail, make their lives a problem that you can benefit off of by sending in the therapist, sending in the social services or whatever. But you're feeding off of black and brown pain. And um, the amazing thing about it is you can't sustain a society like that. You can't. That's why you had those judges that just got rounded up um, for selling those children. And these were little white children. Selling them with longer sentences because they had stock in the prison industrial complex. Mm -mm. You know, he who, this is continues what he said. He who was permitted by law to have no property of his own can with difficulty conceive that property is fun, is founded in anything but force. These slaves chose to steal from their neighbors rather than work. And in most instances were reduced to slavery again. Time, education, and proper modeling might, however, make slaves into morally responsible and productive free labor. Ain't this a bitch? Oops. Maybe or maybe not, Jefferson thought. I am decided on my final return to America to try this one. I shall endeavor to import as many Germans as I have grown slaves. I will settle them in my slaves on farms of 50 acres each. Intermingled and place all of the footing of the meta, meta layers, that's tenant farmers, of Europe which meant that they were not to own the property they farmed. Their children shall be brought up as others are, in habits of property and foresight. And I have no doubt but that they will be good citizens, as some of their fathers will be also. Others, I suppose, will need government to oblige them as a labor as the laboring poor of Europe do. And to apply these, their comfortable sub substance and produce of their labor, retaining such a moderate portion of it as it may be quite equivalent for the use of the land that they labor on. Despite his intention to try the experiment, he never did. And his plan did not envision ownership, only tenancy. If the plan had been tried and had been successful, Jefferson would still have been the legal possessor of the land. Even if Jefferson felt discomfort when among his Paris associates about the conflict between his opinions and his ownership of slaves, his hypocrisy probably was disregarded. It may have never come up. It may have been tactfully avoided. For them, well, they, yeah, because they, they, they got a good way of avoiding uh, reality and giving themselves credit for everything in the universe and putting themselves in the place of God, which innately by nature, the, 
the, the, the black man can't worship the white man as a god. For them, the reality of Jefferson as slaveholder apparently had much less presence than his moral opposition to the institution. None of his French friends owned slaves. None of his French friends owned slaves, a legal impossibility, which differentiated him from the abolitionists like Rousseau, Richard Price, Edward Bancroft, and the most distinguished intellectual whom Jefferson conversed with in Paris, the Marquise de la Condorcet. Condorcet. Well known for his brilliance as a mathematician and social scientist, Condorcet may have influenced Jefferson's arithmetic in claiming that the length of a generation was 19 years in his argument that each new generation should not be responsible for the debt of the previous one. <coughs> mm -hmm. Jefferson read Condorcet's, uh, Condorcet's denunciation of slavery and reflections of the Negro, a powerfully elegant screed, two copies of which Jefferson bought in 1788. He decided to uh, translate it, a contribution to the effort and, I mean, to persuade the next generation of Americans to do what this generation could not. In late 1788, he translated the opening passages. There is no evidence that he showed them to court the set or anyone else. And it probably was not his intention to have his name affixed to the translator. He did not explain why he did not uh, go further. Um, perhaps he decided that the project was too risky. He kept the manuscript in his private possession. Two years later, Jefferson wrote to Condorcet about a free um, African American, a worthy and respectable member of society whose very elegant solutions of geometrical problems ha he had seen. I shall be delighted to see these instances of moral eminence so multiplied as to prove that the want of talents observed in them is merely the effect of their degraded condition and not proceeding from any difference in the structure or parts on which intellect depends. <coughs> really? <coughs> now, did Jefferson believe Condorcet's claim that nature had endowed blacks with the same genius, with the same judgment, the same virtues as whites? As he translated from the French to English, were Jefferson's convictions as well as his being committed to the words that came out of his lying-ass mouth? The translation could have been exploration or conclusion, or even both. Even if he agreed with Condorcet, the gap between principle and practice remained. Between the continuation of his life as the benevolent slaveholder, ooh, he, did something. he thought himself to be an immoralistic philosopher for whom, in the abstract, slavery was a moral evil. The translation is another instance, though a slanting one, of Jefferson's commitment to writing his resilient his reliance on the written word to engage with subjects of importance to him. And also the oddly ironic situation in which he placed himself, his pen at the service of what his daily life did not embody, of what his intellect was capable of and what his moral principles supported. 
but what his practical life and the world into which he had been born did not. When Jefferson arrived in Monticello uh, in December of 1789, the welcome he received from his slaves must have seemed entirely compatible with the necessities of life and his sense of what he deserved. For him, slavery remained an essential reality of his time and place. Life as he had known it and as he expected to be for some time did not admit of an alteration in his psychological and economic structure. The land that he returned to possessed him and he possessed it and his slaves, whatever his relationships were with them, were inseparable from the land because it was inconceivable that he could work the land himself or pay people to do so. He believed it would be of little use to him without slaves. And the land and what he built on it were inseparable from the fundamental values he also deeply held. Friends, family, education, knowledge, patrimony, and patriotism. What y'all think about that? What y'all think about this late hypocrisy of these founding fathers that is just so sickly? And as black people, we got to wake up to the kind of rulership that we're under. No political party is going to help us unless we create it and form it for ourselves. No Democrat, no Republic, but especially not a Republic, is going to do anything to help us. Their whole stick is power, and we don't have none. Okay? What y'all think about that? What y'all think about this hypocrisy? In Paris, where Thomas Jefferson really got to show his behind. But anyway, leave your comment below. Let me know what you think about that. And I'll see you in the next video.